Hi boys and girls, it's Miss Mia here. I know that some of you are quite disappointed that we didn't get to read to the end of Beowulf together as a class. So I've decided to read you the story from the very beginning. Just um, FYI, this is going to be quite a long video. So if you'd rather skip ahead and listen to the end of the story, then I will not be offended whatsoever. I will also be focusing the camera on the pages so you can read along, follow whilst I'm reading. And um, there will be some words I won't be able to pronounce and I'll be moving ahead very swiftly, just so you're aware. All right, hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. Beowulf. Stranger, called Hygelac, the man near the king stopped talking and picking their teeth and swilling stone called mead over their gums. Stranger, called Hygelac. In the hall of the king of the Geats, a hundred men listened, almost silenced. The catfire hissed and spat, golden-eyed tapestries winked out of the gloom. Silence. The men rose from the stranger's seat. The man rose from the stranger's seat. Your name, demanded Hygelac. Ganglery, said the stranger. In your tongue, wanderer. All right, wanderer, it's time you sang for your supper. Men on the mead benches shifted their buttocks and stretched out their legs, the gathering face inwards towards the fire. Wanderer stood in the poet's place by the hearth and rubbed his one gleaming eye. I'll fool you, he said, with a true story and one close to my heart, this story of the past and present and future. True, called out a young man, the king's nephew, Beowulf by name. How can it be true if it's in the future? Because it's not finished, said Wanderer. You must finish it. Beowulf, how old was he? Not more than twenty felt his cheeks flush with quickening blood. Wanderer stooped and scooped up six stringer, the harp that always stood in the poet's place. Gleaming maple wood, white willow pegs, white fingertips, a quivering face. Listen, said Wanderer, a story of heroes. Now he plucked the harp with a plectrum. A story of monsters, and plucked it again. A story of Denmark. Ugh! said Hygelac, and spat into the straw at his feet, the old enemy. But Beowulf leaned forward. Hadn't his own father Ejtheo once taken refuge with the Danes? Hadn't Hrothgar, the Danish king, saved his father's skin? Hrothgar, he sounded a good man. The first king of the Danes was, said Wanderer. I loved him dearly. He was set adrift, no man knows where. He was found a tiny child on the shores of Denmark, but he became mighty king. All the neighbouring tribes over the Wales Way had to obey him and pay him tribute. Even the Geats, added Hygelac in disgust. Do you know we had to pay the Danes tribute never again? And when he died, said Wanderer, he returned to the ocean by which he had come. He lay. He was laid by the mast, as Boulder will be, surrounded by weapons and treasure. They placed a golden banner above his head and led the waves take him. They bequeathed him to the sea. In Wanderer's hand, the harp cried the stabbing cries of seabirds and wept the sea waves, weeping, salt waves weeping. His son was Beo and his grandson, Healthdean, said Wanderer, both brave kings, but I sing now of his great-grandson, the living king, Rothgar. Beowulf nodded. Rothgar, he had known it. When he was a young man, Rothgar built a glorious feasting hall, the finest in, on this middle earth. Herot, he called it Herot. Day after day, the rafters echoed with the din of merrymaking, men drinking mead uh, and ale. Year after year, the king rewarded his followers with gifts at the feast, arm rings of twisted gold, brooches, buckles, belts, beaver skin bags. Can you imagine it? My father has stood on the hall, on that hall floor. Rothgar gave my father treasures in Herod. That's what Beowulf was thinking. And can you imagine, said Wanderer, pausing and piercing Beowulf with his sword of an eye. There was one, just one outsider who could not bear the sound coming from the hall, the laughter, the happiness, the poet's song and harp in harmony. Wanderer spun round, raised his elbow, spread out his cloak and pointed at his monstrous shadow on the wall, the shadow reaching right above right above the gables. Grendel, growled Wanderer. Grendel is his name. The, half, the hall was firelit and warm, and the Geats there felt chill. No one knows where he lives. He ranges and moors the fen and the fastness. He is a father of every evil being, monsters and dark elves and spiteful spirits. Wanderer slowly turned back to, his, to face his audience. One night Grendel came to Herod. He came calling on the Danes when they were dead drunk, sprawled out and snoring. That monster barged in and broke the necks of thirty Thanes. Thirty! He cried... He carried them out into the night and away to his lair. 
Beowulf crouched on the edge of the bench, intent, almost angry. Next morning, said Wondro, when Hrothgar came to the hall, its guardians were gone, all thirty of them, and of Grendel there was not a trace except his gruesome spore. Wondro said the, the words so that no one could mistake them or escape them. He was back next day, continued Wondro, and after that the Danes learned their lesson. Those who had escaped his clutches stowed themselves into dark crannies and corners in the outbuildings. The great hall Herod stood deserted after nightfall. Hygelac shook his head and breathed deeply. For twelve years now, Grendel has terrorised the Danes, men and women and children, old and young. They all live under the dark death shadow. He is so strong, so huge, so loathsome that no one is able to do anything about it. I will then... Beowulf leaped up in front of the Geat and heard himself shouting, I will then. Wanderer's eyes gleamed. He watched the warrior unblinking and spurred him on. All right, Beowulf, sir, called the king. That as it should be. There were cheers in Hygelac's hall. You've proved yourself much the strongest man here, said the king. Now prove it elsewhere. Brave men should seek fame in far off lands. The cheers were renewed. There were shouts and boasts in the hall. The mead horn passed from man to man and each of them toasted Beowulf. The next morning Beowulf chose fourteen men, as keen and well-tempered as warriors can be, to travel with him to Denmark. The stronghold of the Geats rang with the blows of blacksmiths and swung on to the shouts of chandlers as armour was made ready, ready, and a boat was fitted for the sea voyage. On the third day there were kisses and embraces on the windswept beach. Some said they feared that Beowulf and his companions would never return. Some wept, some said nothing. Then the warriors were eager to begin their journey. They turned their backs on mothers and fathers and wives and children. They spring-heeled over the shingle and embarked. The great seabird rode over the breakers, and as soon as the Geats hoisted a sail, a bleached sea garment, the boat formed, foamed at the prow and surged over the waves, urged on by the wind. After that day and the night that darkened it, the warriors sighted shining cliffs, steep headlands at the shores of Denmark. A Danish coast guard stood on a cliff top. He watched the boat beat across the black and dazzling field of water and heard it, heard it beach screaming on the shingle. When he saw the men carrying flashing shields and gleaming war gear down the gangway, he leaped on his horse and, brandishing a spear, galloped down to the water's edge. Warriors, he shouted. Who are you? Where do you come from? Beowulf held up his right hand like a flag. Peace. <coughs> Your names, demanded the coast guard. What are you doing here? Before you step one foot further into Denmark. Friends of the Danes, called Beowulf. Foes of the monster, said one of his companions. That's the sum of it, Beowulf said. We're all Geat, and I am Beowulf, the son of Edgethea. We've heard that Grendel has laid his hand on the Danes. No man can stand against him, said the coast guard. That is why we've come, said Beowulf. I'm here to pit myself against this monster. I mean to put an end to Grendel. A long, bright gaze, a slow nod, a half smile. Brave words, said the coast guard, but every wise man knows that a wide ocean divides words from deeds. Beowulf smiled and inclined his head. Then the coast guard welcomed Beowulf and his companions undertook to watch over their boat and set them on the paved road that led to Herod. In high spirits, the Geats headed for the hall of the Danish king. The helmets crowned with boar crest shone under the sun. Strong links of shining, chaining mail clinked together. They followed the track over the surges of lonely moorland and before dark marched up to the huge timbered hall hung with many antlers hemmed in by outbuildings. Herod, Rothgar's court, a bright home of brave men, a muster of warriors hurried out to meet, Ge meet the Geats and challenged them as the coast guard had done. I am Beowulf and my news is for the king. Have you come as exiles? asked one Danish warrior. Or, said another man, out of ambition. My news is for Rothgar, Beowulf repeated. You'll hear about it soon enough. Ask him. Will he give us leave to speak with him? The Danes told Beowulf and his band to leave their weapons against one wall. Linden shields inlaid with gold, coats of mail, or a grey-tipped forest of ash spears. Then they led the Geats into Herod. Woven stories on the four walls, a gamut of famous men and daring deeds, amber and umber, blue and green and gold, golden misples at the candlelight table, gleaming discs and garners set into the mead benches, a waft of herbs, rosemary and thyme, a hundred voices lifted in harmony. As Beowulf and his companions entered Herod and looked round in wonder, the noise fell back in front of them. 
watched by curious Danes, they walked up a silent clearing right up to the king esconed on his throne. Greetings, Rothgar. I am Beowulf the Great, uh, the Geat, Echthaeo's son. Echthaeo's son? Rothgar's kind old face was creased and grey. You are welcome, then, and so are your companions. Is it true? Beowulf demanded. This hall, even your own hall, is unsafe after dark. Rothgar grimaced. Eh, grimaced. Every day at dusk, the talking must stop, drinking must stop. Those still alive have to leave this hall. I, said Beowulf, am thirty strong. I'm going to crush this monster in single combat. At once the hall began to ripple with excited cross currents of sound. Rothgar gazed at the young warrior, his eyes so full of light, then his own glazed. You could tell he was travelling the green roads of memory. It's because of his father, Rothgar, was thinking he's come because I once shouted at Theo and paid off his feud. Isn't that it? The king got up and grasped Beowulf's right hand. And I've heard this monster is so reckless he does without weapons, Beowulf said. Rothgar's face crumpled in pain. I'll fight on equal terms then, no sword. Beowulf, objected Rothgar, and no yellow shield. I'll grapple this fiend hand to hand, Beowulf paused. Hygelac, my king, would expect no less. Beowulf, began Rothgar, but the Geat cut him off a second time. And he should have his coat of mail if I die. This corset made by Wieland, send it back to Hygelac. As you are, said Rothgar. Beowulf shrugged. Who knows, fate goes always as it must. First, said Rothgar, putting a hand on Beowulf's arm and turning him round to face the Danish warriors. Take your place at our feast. Eat and drink after your long journey. A bench was cleared for the fifteen Geats. One man bought hunks of boiled pork and the other wholemeal bread. A third carried an arm cask and an adorned ale cup, and each of the warriors emptied it in one draught. They stretched and relaxed. Their blood began to sing. The Danes had been drinking all day, boisterous, brooding, snoring, sitting or sprawling. They surrounded the band of Geats. The king's two sons were amongst them. One of the Danes, a burly man with beating eyebrows, glared at Beowulf. So, he called out, this Geat, this Geat thinks he can succeed where we failed, does he? Who is that man? said Beowulf. Me, leered the man. I'm on Firth, and I can tell a sto- I can tell a story about you, Beowulf. Keep it to yourself, on Firth, said another Dane. And another, you're asking for trouble. Let him tell it, said Beowulf. I'm curious to hear it. Speak up, Unferth. You won't get far with Grendel, said Unferth. Never, not if you're the same man who went swimming with Brecker. I've heard about your contest. Who could swim the longer? Unferth twice banged on the table with his fist. After seven days, you gave up. Brecker had you beat. You're drunk, Unferth. I'll tell you the true story. Brecker and I swam side by side for five days and five nights until the tides tore us apart. Big man, sneered Unferth. Foaming water, freezing cold, we each held a naked sword to ward off whales. Whales, eh? said Unferth unpleasantly. White bait, more likely. Brecker was washed up, said Beowulf calmly. But I was dragged down to the ocean bed by the sea monster. I fought with it and buried my sword in its breast. Beowulf's companions growled in support. If a man is brave enough, said Beowulf, and not doomed to die, fate often spares him to fight another day. Unferth rubbed his bloodshot eyes. You, he jeered, you're a grinning Geat, a pop, pop, a poppycock hero. And you, Unferth, said Beowulf, who are you to talk? Again, the Geats growled. You cannot bear another man's success where others sing praises. You're so, uh, you sow dragon's teeth. If your actions match your big mouth, Grendel would never have caused such havoc in Herod. Unfair spat on the ground and said nothing. Grendel does as he likes with Danes, but soon, very soon, I'll show this monster what the gats are made of. With that, Beowulf turned his back on Unferth, and as he did so, he saw the Danish queen, Wealthio, entering the hall, purple gown and long grey hair and violet eyes. Flanked by two ladies-in-waiting, Wealthio swept up to the dais, and there the ale thane put the adorned cup into her hands. The queen offered it first to the king, and then she walked over to Be- Beowulf and offered it to- next to him. Lady, Beowulf said, I have come to deliver your people... Deliver your people or die in Grendel's clutches. That is my choice. Here, in this hall, I'll kill this monster or lay down my life. Twelve winters without hope, said Welfio slowly. She paused and smiled sadly at the Geat. At least we have hope tonight. 
Since it was built, called Rothgar, this great hall herald has never been guarded by anyone but Danes. Take it, look after it, give no quarter, Beowulf. Then all the Danish warriors rose from their seats and, led by Rothgar and his queen, made their way out of the hall and into the gathering dark, away to the safety of the outbuildings. There was almost silence in Herod. The Gaius looked around, they listened to the hall creak and small night wind, and they began to lay aside their helmets and corslets. Then... Each man took a bolster from one corner of the hall and found himself a sleeping place. Leave him to me, said Beowulf. I'll fight him hand to hand. The gouts lay down and spoke in low voices, except for Beowulf. Not one of them believed he would see the next day or dawn, or ever go back to his family and friends. And that's Grendel. Through the dark night, a darker shape slid. A sinister figure shrived down from the moors over high shoulders, sopping tussocks over sheep runs and gurgling over gurgling streams. It shrived towards a timbered hall, huge and hairy and slightly stooping. Its long arms swung loosely. One man was snoring, one mumbling, one coughing. All the guards guarding Harold had fallen asleep, all except one. One man watching. Big one man watching. For a moment, the shape waited outside the hall. It cocked an ear. It began to quiver. Its hair bristled. Then it gasped, grasped the great ring handle and swung open the door, the mouth of Herod. It lunged out of the darkness and into the circle of dim candlelight. It took a long stride across the patterned floor. Through half-closed eyes, Bear was watching, and through barred teeth, he breathed one word, Grendel. The name of the monster, the loathsome syllables. Grendel saw the knot of sleeping warriors, and his eyes shone with an unearthly light. He lurched towards the nearest man, a brave gear called Leofric, scooped him up, and with one ghastly claw choked the scream in his throat. Then the monster ripped him apart, bit into his body, drank the blood from his veins, devoured huge pieces within one minute. He had swallowed the whole man, even his feet and hands. Still the gear slept. The air in Herod was thick with, sleep, with their sleep, thicker still with the death and the stench of the monster. Grendel slobbered spittle and blood. His first taste of uh, flesh only made him more ravenous. He wheeled round towards Beowulf, sto uh, stopped, reached out for him, and Beowulf, Beowulf leaped up and stayed at the monster's outstretched arm. Grendel grunted and pulled back, and at the sound, all the other guards were, were instantly awake. They grabbed their swords, they backed off, they shouted for Beowulf. Grendel tried to break free, but Beowulf held him fast. The monster snorted and tugged. He could feel his fingers cracking in the Gaird's grip. Now the grey room boomed. Clang and clutter shattered the night silence as Beowulf and Grendel lurched to and fro in a deathly tug of war. Tables and meat benches were overturned. Grendel roared. This is them fighting snarled and in the outbuildings Danes woke and listened to the darkness. When the Gaeads saw the Grendel could not escape Beowulf's grip, they surrounded him and slashed at him with their swords. Herald flashed with battle lights. Those warriors did not know that did not know that no kind of weapon or even the finest iron on earth could wound their enemy. His skin was like old rind, tough and almost hard. He had a wove, he had woven a secret spell against every kind of battle blade. Now Beowulf twisted Grendel's right arm behind his neck. He locked it and turned it. Slowly he turned it, putting terrible pressure on Grendel's shoulder. The monster bellowed and dropped to one knee. He jerked and his whole body shuddered and trembled. With su superhuman strength, he jerked again as he tried to escape Beowulf's grip. He jerked and all at once his right shoulder ripped. A ghastly tearing of muscle and sinew and flesh. A spurting of hot blood. The monster's arm came apart from his body. Grendel howled. He staggered away from Beowulf and reeled out of the hall. The guards cheered and shouted. They hugged one another. They converged on Beowulf. Beowulf was gasping. I wanted to throttle him. He's finished, roared one guard. Here and now. Done for, shouted another. I couldn't hold him. Not strong enough. Wherever he goes, said a third companion, death goes with him. I've done as I said, Beowulf panted, and avenged Leofric. Until that very moment, the Gaeads were not aware that they had lost one of their companions. They listened as Beowulf told them what had happened when Grendel first came into the hall, and all their joy of the monster's death turned to anger and gloom at the fate of Leofric. Look at his hand, muttered one man, each nail like steel, each claw, I'd say. Ten terrifying spikes, hand, arm and shoulder. No man can withstand, withstand Beowulf, and no monster neither. Beowulf raised a hand, and the Gaeads fell as silent. Hang it up, Beowulf said. 
stick it up outside the door under the gable and then give Rothgar news of my victory. Bell's companions hastened to do as he asked. One man climbed on to another shoulder. Sho one man climbed onto another shoulders just outside the great door, and by guttering candle, I secured Grendel's grass, blood-stained and battle-hardened, under the gable. Two others found brands at the hearth, rekindled them in the embers, and headed for the outbuildings. Within a few minutes, the first Danish warriors hurried into the hall. Others followed on their heels, and then at dawn, as the eastern sky turned pale green mackerel, the king himself proceeded to the hall on his old unsteady legs, as watered by Wealthio, his queen. He paused at the door, marvelled at the monster's grasp, and then embraced Beowulf. This hall, Herod, Beowulf said, I return it to you once again, and you can call it your own. I'd lost hope, Rothgar said, lost all belief that anyone could end it, this monstrous nightmare. Twelve winters, said Wealthio. I kept my word, Beowulf said, and fought hand to hand on equal terms. Beowulf, Best of men, from this day on, I will treat you like a son. Whatever I have here on this Middle Earth will be yours also. Wealthia looked troubled at the king's words, but she smiled and said nothing. Once more, Rothgar stepped forward and embraced Beowulf. Word of Grendel's death quickly spread far and wide. Throughout that day, hundreds of Danes converged on Herod to stare at the monster's cruel grasp, and in the evening, Rothgar held a feast in honour of Beowulf and the Geats. The king gave Beowulf shining rewards for killing Grendel, a stiff battle banner woven with golden thread, a helmet incised with battle scenes, a coat of mail, and finest of all, the huge Damascan sword that once belonged to Helfdeen, the king's own father. Then, at a sign from Rothgar, eight horses with gold-plated bridles pranced into the hall. This saddle, said Rothgar, so well cut and inlaid with precious stones, this is my own. Take it and take these horses and make good use of them. Finally, Rothgar gave a gold buckle to each of the Geats who had crossed the sea with Beowulf and decreed that gold should be paid for the life of the warrior Leofric. The warriors drank and feasted and drank again. Then the poet sang a, sang a jay. He compared Beowulf to Siegmund, the dragon slayer. Waves of noise broke out along the benches, talk and laughter. As he used to be, said Rothgar. And will be, said Wealthio. Give rewards, Rothgar, while you may. But remember your own sons. Leave this land, leave this Danish people to, your, to our sons when the day comes for you to die. At the end of the evening, Rothgar and Wealthio retired to their quarters and Beowulf conducted to bed in the outbuildings where he could sleep alone and more peacefully. He was wary after his night's work. But all the other Danes and Geats remained in Herald. Benches were pushed back, the whole floor was padded with bolsters and pillows and at each man's head his helmet and coat of mail, his spear and shield gleamed in the gloom. Sides of the hall, dark and deeper dark, another night for men. One of the feasts of sleeping in hell was doomed and soon to die. And this is a picture of them celebrating. And then we have this Grendel's mother. Let's see what she's going to do. In the middle of the night two servants with flaming torches roused Beowulf from his sleep and escorted him to Rothgar's chamber. Ashir, said the king. He took his head and his face creased a Grey grief map. Now, Ashir! I am here, Beowulf said. Ashir is dead, my dear old friend, my battle companion. In the hall. Two monsters, just as some men have said. There are two monsters, after all. Rulers of the moors, rangers of the fell country. Grendel and his mother. And they will never end. It will end, Beowulf said. She came to Herot, said the king. She barged into the hall, mournful and ravenous, snatched down Grendel's grasp. From the gable, seize the nearest man, is she my friend? Vengeance, Beowulf said. She just tucked it she just tucked him under her arm and made off into the darkness. There is honour amongst monsters as there is honour amongst men. Grendel's mother came to the hall to avenge the death of her son. Once again, Beowulf, help may be had from you alone. Do not grieve, Beowulf said. Her lair is away, and over the misty moors at the bottom of a lake. Better each man should avenge his dead as Grendel's mother has done. Your days are numbered and my days are numbered. Beowulf put a hand on the old king's arm. He who can, he who can should win, renown, fame before death. That is a warrior's best memorial in the world. I promise you, Rothgar, that whatever she turns honeycomb caves, mountain woods, I will hunt her down. As soon as the night ceased, Beowulf stallion, one of the 
Sorry, as soon as the night eased, Beowulf's stallion, one of Hrothgar's gift, was saddled and bridled. He left Herald at once, accompanied by the king, his own companions and a large group of Danes. They followed the monster tracks through the forest and over the hills, then they headed into little known country wolf slopes windswept headlands perilous ways across boggy moors they waded through a freezing stream that plunged from beetling crags and rushed seething through a f through a fissure picked their way along string thin paths skirted small skirted more small lakes where water demons lived as they came to a dismal wood, stiff with hoar frost, standing on the edge of the precipice. The lake lay beneath the lair of Grendel and his gruesome mother. It was bloodstained and troubled. Whipped waves reared up and reached from the sky until the air was misty and heaven weeped. The Geats and Danes made their way down to the side of the water. Beowulf braced his shoulders, put on his clinking corslet and donned. His helmet hung with chainmail to guard his neck. Then Unferth stepped forward. Beowulf looked at him coldly. He had not forgotten the encounter in the hall. I did you a great wrong in Herod, Unferth said. Too much beer. What passed is past, Beowulf said. You're the only man alive who would risk this fight. Then it's right. I should risk it. Take my sword, Beowulf, runting, it never fails. Beowulf grasped the sword, smiled and clapped on Firth on the shoulder. Then he turned to Rothgar. If this monster covers me with a sheet of shining blood. No, Beowulf. Then, look after my companion, send my guest to Hyglak and give this great sword back to Unferth. Beowulf did not even wait for an answer. He dived it from the bank into the water and one of the Geats put a horn to his lips and blew an eager battle song. For a whole day Beowulf stroke down through the water then Grendel's mother saw him heading for her lair. The sea wolf rose to meet. So here we have Grendel's mother spotted Beowulf and they are wrapped around one another in the middle of another fight. Let's see what happens. Spotted him, clutched at him, grabbed him, swept him down and into the great vaulted chamber, a hall underwater, untouched by water. The, the Geat wrestled free of Grendel's mother. She was coated with her own filth, red-eyed and roaring. He whirled the sword, runting, and played terrible war music on the monster's skull. Grendel's mother roared the louder Be Beowulf saw she was unharmed. Useless, he shouted. It's useless or else magic spells protect her. He held the sword away and began to grapple with Grendel's mother. Beowulf threw the monster to the ground, but then she tripped him, held him in a fearsome clinch and drew a dagger. Beowulf could not throw her off. Then Grendel's mother stabbed at Beowulf's heart. She stabbed again, but the cunning links of chainmail held firm and guarded Beowulf. His corslet saved him. Now the Geat sprang to his feet. He saw a sword, massive and double-edged, made by giants lying in the corner of the chamber. It was so huge that only he of all men could have handled it. Beowulf ran across the floor, gripped the ringed hilt and swung the ornamented sword. He struck Grendel's mother as she lumbered towards him. The blade slashed through her neck, slashed the vertebrae. The monster moaned and fell dead at his feet. For a long while, Beowulf leaned on the bloodstained sword. His heart was pounding. A man with the strength of thirty, slayer of Grendel and slayer of the sea wolf. A hero without equal in this middle world. Then Beowulf looked about him. He saw a recess, a small cave, and in the cave he found Grendel's body, drained of lifeblood. As a trophy, Beowulf said grimly, and with one blow, he severed the monster's head. Your head and this massive sword. The Geat spoke too soon. The patterned blade had begun to drip and melt like a gory icicle. Because of the venom in the monster's blood, it thawed entirely right up to the hilt. So Beowulf grasped all that remained of it, picked up the sword, runting and Grendel's head, and left that vaulted chamber. He swam up through the water. Beowulf's companions, still waiting at the lakeside, were overjoyed to see their leader. They handed him up onto the bank and marvelled at his trophies. Quickly, they relieved him of his helmet and corslet. After the ninth hour, one Geat said, it seemed hopeless. We still hope, said another. And the Danes, Beowulf asked. They went back to Herod, said one man. And another, when the water boiled with blood, they thought it was all over. So it was, said Beowulf, for Grendel's mother. 
The guards tied Grendel's head to the great pole, a battering ram. Four of them shouldered it. Then, with songs on their lips, Beowulf and his companions left the lake. The journey back to the Gold Hall seemed far, far shorter than their outward journey, and this, at same evening they carried the monster's head onto the floor where the warriors were drinking. A ghastly sight paraded before Hrothgar and his queen. Beowulf walked up before the gift throne, firm-footed, flanked by his companions. Hrothgar, he said. Son of Helfdene, ruler of the Danes, proudly we lay before you plunder from the lake. Rothgar shook his white head and smiled and embraced the Geat. Beowulf, he said, bravest of men, fate's darling. Your friends are fortunate, your enemies not to be envied. Even Runting was useless, said Beowulf, but it was my ally. Do not think I underrate it. He returned the sword to Unferth and thanked him for the loan. Tell us everything. Tell us all and everything, urged the old king. I tell you, Rothgar, you and your warriors can sleep in this gold hall without fear. The death shadow will skulk near, herald no longer. Then Beowulf related what had happened after he had left the Geats and Danes at the lakeside. The companions ate and drank, and weary in their bones lay, re lay down to rest. The great hall herald soared spacious and adorned with gold. The guests slept within until the black raven proclaimed sunrise. Bright lights chased away the shadows of the night. In the morning, Geats and Danes met in the hall once again and... Beowulf told Rothgar that now that Grendel and his mother were dead, he and his companions were eager to return home. Stay no longer, Rothgar said. Will you stay? No man could have treated us with greater kindness, but I must tell Hyglak we want to see our families and friends. Your people, said the king, would do well to choose you as Hyglak's successor. They could not have a better king. If ever you need me, Beowulf said, send for me and I will come. I'll come at once, ready for combat and bring warriors by the thousand. And, because of your exploits, the old enmity between Gaeus and Danes will come to an end, Rothgar said, his voice rising. Beowulf took the arm of the old king. For as long as I live, Rothgar continued, Gaeus and Danes will exchange treasures. Men will send gifts over the seas with where Gannets swoop and rise. Then Rothgar gave Beowulf twelve great treasures and kissed and embraced him. Tears streamed down the king's face. He was old and knew he was unlikely to ever see brave Beowulf again. He couldn't conceal his sense of loss. In his heart and in his head, in his very blood, a deep love burned for the, that young warrior. So Beowulf and the Geats bade farewell to Hrothgar, wealthier and the Danish warriors. They left the gold hall, Herod, taking all their treasure with them. On their stallions, they galloped over the empty moorland. They hurried towards their waiting boat and the rocking sea, the gull's path, the whale road to their own dear country. After Hygelic had died and his sons were killed in battle, Beowulf ruled the Geats for fifty years. Seasons of peace, once Beowulf had beaten off the grasping Swedes, murderous Frisians, cruel Franks, seasons of friendship as Rothgar had foretold between Geats and Danes. Old Beowulf was a strong land guardian, a wise king. From Beowulf's hall and the buildings clustered around it, the stronghold of the Geats, a windswept moor, reached up to the headland of eagleness. That was a desolate place, a prow of land jutting out into to the ocean pre precipitous riddled with caves precipitous riddled with caves sorry one night a slave on the run a poor man who preferred the misery of exile to the master's whip took refuge in one of the one of these caves at dawn the slave stiffened in horror. He saw there was a dragon in the cave, a serpent scaled and sleeping, and all around the dragon lay sh a shining hoard, precious stones, silver, gold, goblets, plates and vessel rings. It had guarded that treasure for the three for three hundred winters. The slave was terrified. He lifted the nearest piece of gold goblet, picked his way right past the dragon's head and out of the cave, and and hard over the moors towards Beowulf's hall. When the dragon woke from its long sleep, it realised at once that its hoard had been robbed. It snorted, and a twisting flame talk leaped out of its mouth. The dragon took revenge. As soon as it was dark, it swooped on the Geats and griddled their stronghold with fire. When day dawned once more, Beowulf and his companions saw the terrible damage and destruction. Buildings gutted or collapsed, exposed to the elements, charred gables and beams, smouldering heaps of ash. All the land around about had been laid waste. It took, it looked like fields of stubble fire after harvesting. Beowulf called the warrior guards to a meeting. They gathered in the hall of his 
young cousin Wiglaf. It was made of stone, the only place in the stronghold to have escaped the fire. A crowd of pale faces, a current of voices, a counting of heads. Never, said Beowulf, has there been an enemy such as this. But if we wait, it will be worse. This dragon will pay us a second visit. The men around him listened and said nothing. There's only one way to put an end to this threat. The only one and only one man who can do it. We've sworn oaths, protested young Wiglaf. I'll never have it said. You've never fought in single combat, Beowulf interrupted. I wrenched off Grendel's arm. I killed his mother. Fifty years, Beowulf. I know myself, cousin Wiglaf. Old I may be, but I'll fight this fight alone. Wiglaf shook his head unhappily. A linden shield will be no use. As soon as his weaponsmith has forged a shield of iron, I'll head for eagleness. At least let some of us come with you, said Wiglaf. As you like, I'll need that wretched thief to show me the way. Later that day, Beowulf and eleven guards, grim face in their helmets, left the smoking stronghold and made their way up to eagleness. Much against his will, the slave led them to the entrance of the dragon's cave, perched high above the ocean with threatening water. The threatening water. Beowulf sat on the headland. His mind was mournful, angry from slaughter. This is not your fight, he said to his companions. Your loyal Wiglaf, or any of you, I'll kill this dragon and win the gold hoard for the Geats, or this life is very short, but not for the fame, the good name that live after. They live after it. Then Beowulf walked up under the cliff and saw steaming water spurting through a stone arch the entrance of the cave to the cave. The leader of the Geats felt battle anger begin to pump inside him. He threw out his chest and gave a great roar. He hammered the grey rock's anvil. At once a gruff of smoke issued from the cave. The cliff itself snarled as a dragon slithered down the slope towards him. Beowulf brandished his sword nagling. He slashed at the serpent's neck, but he could not pierce his skin scale corslet. Flames leaped through the air, brighter than day's bright light. Beowulf sheltered behind his shield. This is no fight for us, said one Geat. He was right. No place for us neither. One lick of that fire and we'll be all cinders. We'll all be cinders. And there's the dragon. The illustration. Wiglaf angrily rounded on his companions. Beowulf gave us rings, armour, helmets, tempered swords. We all swore to help him if ever the need arose. You heard him, said one man. You heard what Beowulf said. We do best to save our own lives. You rat, shouted Wiglaf. He turned his back on his cowardly companions and stormed up the slope towards Beowulf, calling. Fight for your name, fight for your fame. I'm here and I'll help you. The dragon welcomed Wiglaf with a blast of flame that set fire to his shield. The young warrior sweltered and crouched behind Beowulf's huge iron shield. As the dragon wheeled, dragging its monstrous body over the screen, Beowulf stood up and crashed nagling against his head. The sword point struck in its skull, then the serpent writhed and bucked and nagling was not strong enough. It bent and it snapped. Beowulf stared in dismay at his gold, old grey-hued sword, and at once the dragon lunged forward. It gripped Beowulf's snag between its sharp teeth. The old king was bathed in blood. It poured out of his arteries and veins. Quickly, Wiglaf took three strides and sank his sword into the dragon's belly. He buried it up to the hilt. The dragon gasped and let go of Beowulf's neck, and at once the flames began to abate. Then Beowulf fumbled for the deadly knife fastened to his corset. He closed his eyes and swayed. Then he launched himself forward, fell against the dragon and slit its throat. The serpent gargled. It jerked and it shuddered. It lay still. Beowulf's neck wound began to burn and swell. The dragon's poison gave him great pain. He tottered forward and slumped on a ledge. Wiglaf unfastened the old king's helmet. Then as Beowulf asked, he hurried up to the cave and brought out some of the hoard so that Beowulf could see it before he died. A gold cup, he said. This salver, this banner made of nothing but gold thread. There were weapons in there too. Enough for an army. I could not carry them. Now this great horde belongs to the Geats, Beowulf said, and you, Cousin Wiglaf, in days to come, you must lead and serve our people. Wiglaf came close to the old king, for his voice was failing. He could only whisper, after the funeral fire, ask the warriors to build a barrow overlooking the sea. It will be, said Wiglaf. Let it tower high on wellness, Beowulf's barrow, a beacon for seafarers. It will be so. Beowulf gave his golden collar to Wiglaf, his helmet ring and corslet. Take them, Wiglaf. You're the last survivor of our family. The rest are dead and I must follow them. Beowulf almost smiled. He sighed and closed his eyes. Wiglaf looked at him tenderly and tears sprang to his eyes. He stared at his lord. 
and he stared at the pr uh, prostrate dragon, both of them swept away by fate. For a while, Wiglaf sat beside the body of his king, thinking of time past and time to come. He did not hear his cowardly companions until there were sighs at his shoulder, sorrowful looks, cringing words. Ten oath breakers, said Wiglaf coldly. Where did you come from? Where did you slink up from? Wiglaf. When the men hear about you, they'll condemn you to exile, far from your families, far from your own land. You're f you fortified forever the happiness of home. Wiglaf would have Wiglaf would have nothing of their protests and excuses. I tell you, death would be better than your disgrace. Then the young warrior told the slave to hurry down to the stronghold and give the news of Beowulf's death to the waiting warriors. Later that day, a great crowd of Gaeads set out for eagerness. They mourned over the body of the old king, and they marvelled at the loathsome dragon, its scales burnished orange and brown and green its coils and folded wings its forked tongue one man measured her 50 paces from head to tail they pushed that serpent over the precipice they gave him to the dark ways far beneath the heaving waters then led by Wiglaf the Gaird swarmed into the dragon's cave and reaped the gold harvest goblets and vessels and solid gold salvers the illustration gold salvers precious swords and carried it back with Beowulf's body to the scorched stronghold. The Swedes, said Wiglaf, and the Frisians and the Franks have been waiting for this day, the day when our lord laid aside laughter, festivity, happiness. The young warrior was weary in spirit and body. Soon enough our hands will hold many a spear chill with dawn cold. The dark raven will tell the eagle of the feast when, with the wolf, it laid bare the bones of corpse. In the morning, every man carried one faggot up to wellness, and there the Gaeads built a funeral pyre, hung round with helmets and shields and shining mail. Then they brought Beowulf's body from the stronghold on a wagon and placed her on the pyre. Farewell to our king! said Wiglaf called out over the sound of weeping, the voices of wind and fire, who often braved the iron-tipped arrow shower, the man who killed a monster and his monstrous mother, dragon slayer. The Gaeds all mourned the death of their king, a maiden sang a dagger at dark at, with dread of days to come, and a man with one gleaming eye walked amongst them, saying, It is finished. Now it is finished, and you finished it. The dark wood smoke soared over the fire. Beowulf's body became ash consumed to its core. Sky swallowed the plume. It took the Gaeths ten days to build Beowulf's barrow, a great beacon known throughout the north world. At its heart lay Beowulf's ashes, and in his honour the Gaeths buried rings and brooches and cups and salvers in that barrow. All the gold Beowulf had gained from the dragon, they bequeathed every piece of shining gold to the earth, and there it still remains untouched by men, of no more use than it was before. Then twelve warriors rode around the barrow, gave grave guardians, brave Gaeats, they chanted a death song, they talked as men should about their dead and living king. Round and round they praise his daring deeds, warm words for a breathing name. Round, they said that all of the kings on earth, he was the kindest, the most gentle, the most just to his people, the most eager, eager for fame. This is a final illustration from the book. And there you have it, boys and girls. We have read the whole of Beowulf from beginning to end. I hope you enjoyed it and you enjoyed listening to the whole story. Um, stay safe and see you all soon. Take care.